in this video I'm going to look at essentially what we were doing before but now using the algebraic or commutator method and I'm a little bit biased against this method I mean it's definitely useful to go through it and it can kind of highlight some uh, more interesting things about uh, about these uh, solutions here to the wave function but like I said I'm a little bit biased against it so I'm going to be going through it a little quite fast uh, and you know the the main takeaway from this is that we're essentially finding the quantum numbers L and M using some other method remember in the previous videos we found that these sort of fell out of the uh, the spherical harmonics. So we had the ML, so the spherical harmonics, uh, and those came from the uh, associated Legendre functions, and so that's where those came from there. Here we're going to find them uh, essentially falling out in the form of the eigenvalues to, uh, you know, to eigenfunction type uh, or operator type formalisms. And so we'll start first with our classical angular momentum, which is equal to uh, the radius uh, cross product with the momentum. And so you can think of that. So if you have the sun here and the earth going around it, then the distance from the sun to the earth is our r, and the momentum is uh, is that way and so this is going to obviously keep going around the Sun here and so that is usually seen as this so X P Y minus Y P X and we could do this for the uh, angular momentum in the X and Y directions as well but since we're mostly going to be using the Z direction I'm going to stick with that uh, and then we can change this, uh, this, these uh, momentum operators into the quantum momentum operators, uh, and so that is uh, going to look like this. So minus i h bar, then the partial derivative with respect to the z direction. And so that is the quantum operator. And so if we Take, if we plug the quantum operator in for each of these P's and we would do it for the uh, LX and LY as well, uh, we end up getting the fundamental commutation relations which uh, look like this. Uh, so we have, so remember a commutation is if we have like something that looks like this. So it would be X, Y minus Y x and it essentially tells us how much something commutes or doesn't commute uh, if something does not commute or if something does commute it'll be equal to zero uh, you know because you can imagine if we had say like two times three equals or minus rather three times two that that's just going to be equal to zero and that tells us that that commutes but these do not commute these uh these angular momentum operators do not commute and so what we actually have is uh, if we have l x commute with l y what we actually end up getting is i h bar l z so this would be if we took each of these right here and plugged it in and actually went through and calculated all of it with each of these p's uh sort of um replaced with these operators here uh, we would find this and so what we find what we find is that it what whatever we put into here it's going to work so the, if we put uh, whatever these are we will get the third one out here uh, and so those actually um, you can actually think about it this way so uh, this one if we if we put the LZ into here and move the LY over here then we would end up getting LX 
uh, out there. And so that is how those commute. And it's from this commu these commutation relations that we actually get the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the uncertainty of Lx times the uncertainty of Ly is greater than or equal to h bar over 2 uh, times L z and so that is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and so we actually want uh, some kind of uh, commutator that does commutate that would end up being equal to zero and so what we end up using is the the square of the total angular momentum which is equal to Lx squared plus Ly squared plus L z squared uh, does actually commute with each of the uh, components. So we have L squared, then L z. This will actually be equal to zero. Uh, and so from this, that, that means that we can know the, uh, the state of the system uh, from both of these, uh, both of these um, operators simultaneously. And so we have our L squared acting on some function F, which in the next video we will find that that F is the spherical harmonics, uh, is equal to some constant times F. So this is our eigenvalue right here. And then we have LZ acting on F will give us some other some other, this is supposed to be a mu times f here. And so we can know both of these things at the same time. So this uh, eigenvalue and this eigenvalue at the same time, since L squared and Lz do, in fact, commute. And so you could go through the calculations and find that those do, in fact, commute. And so the next thing we're going to do is is define a ladder operator, so L plus and L minus, which we define, and this is the same as uh, how we did in the, uh, the harmonic oscillator, Lx plus or minus uh, I times Ly. And so if you remember the ladder operator, so uh, they call it a ladder operator because if we're at some state here, uh, we can use the L plus, the L plus, and it will move our state up some energy level here. We could do 2L plus, and you know that would essentially move it up two of those there, but we could also use our L minus, and it would move us down one. We could do 2L minus, and that would move us down two and so on but we do want to get to a point where there is no more down and we want to get to a point where there is no more up such that if we acted with our l with our l plus on our function here that we would get zero and if we acted with our l minus on our function here we would also get zero and so this is what our ladder function actually does. And so this ladder function, if we try commuting it with L squared, uh, L plus or L minus, uh, we would find that this does commute and we get zero. Uh, and with L z and our L plus or our L minus, uh, we get plus or minus h bar L plus or minus. So it's essentially just the L plus or minus times an H bar, uh, which, you know, you can kind of see uh, probably H bar is going to be the distance between each of the rungs on this ladder. Um, and so from here, we can say that uh, that L, L plus or L minus acting on F is an eigenfunction, so is an eigen eigenfunction. I'll just put eigen f here of l squared and l 
z. And so essentially what that's saying is, so remember we have our L square acting on F is equal to lambda times F. But then if we do L squared acting on L plus or L minus F, that would also give us our lambda times our L plus or minus F. So we can think of this L acting on L plus or minus F acting on our L plus or minus acting on F as sort of a new function. And that new function is an eigenfunction of L squared. And so we end up getting that same lambda from there. Uh, but with LZ, so we have LZ acting on F gave us our mu times F. So LZ acting on L plus or minus F. Well, since we had this up here, uh, now what we actually find for this is that we have mu, mu plus or minus H bar uh, times our L plus, plus or minus acting on F. So we end up with this uh, extra H bar here. And so this eigenvalue here, we can actually think of, we can actually think of as H bar L, with L being uh, some integer. Uh, and if you remember, so, well, the integers we'll find are actually going to be between uh, are going to be m, which are going to be between minus l and plus l, but uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But this is uh, essentially telling us that uh, that if we have h bar times one, then uh, we are we are increasing by one h bar, which, as I said, is the distance between uh, any two of these rungs. So this would be uh, h bar here. So uh, H bar right here, and this would actually be 2 H bar. Uh, so in this instance right here, L is equal to 1. In this instance, L is equal to 2. Uh, and so that's what that, uh, that L is telling us right here, where obviously you can see then that uh, that that L can range, uh, or that the the numbers that we'll end up with there can range between positive and minus. And like I said, we'll find that that is equal to M. So we can actually put M here and M here. Uh, and then M equals minus two. So M is what we'll actually end up going in there for that L. But we'll get to that here in just a, a minute. All right, and so from this, uh, what we can do uh, so if we have our L plus, our L plus minus times our L minus plus, so it would be L plus times L minus or L minus times L plus, uh, what we end up getting is L squared minus LZ squared minus plus I times I H bar L Z and like I said once again I'm I'm skipping over quite a few of the the calculations here uh, but then this we could actually uh, so if you just add if you just add this to both sides we get uh, we get L squared is equal to L plus minus L minus plus plus L Z squared minus plus h bar l z well we know from earlier that uh that the l z um is equal to this h bar l right here so this is actually h bar squared l squared and this right here is also h bar l but then we also have this multiplied by h bar here uh, and I'll take it down here. So h bar L, well, h bar squared L squared uh, minus and plus 
our h bar squared l. And then if we sort of pull out the h bar squared and an l, then we get l plus, well, minus or plus 1. And if we want to look at this just in terms of uh, at the top of the the ladder here, so if we if so we have this l squared here, we have this l squared here being equal to all this. And remember this uh, this part right here was our h bar squared l times l plus one. And so if we do l squared acting on our f at the at the top that will give us the uh, the h bar squared l times l plus 1 acting on f at the top uh, and if we did it at the bottom so as you see right here I just use the l plus 1 if we did it at the bottom what we would end up getting is uh, is h bar squared l times l minus 1 uh, f and we'll just put bottom here and uh, I'm actually going to do what Griffiths does and put a bar over these L's to signify that they're not exactly the same as the other L's and in fact uh, so well to just to kind of back up what we found here is that that eigenvalue is equal to H bar squared L times L plus 1 uh, when we are at the at the top and our eigenvalue did I call it eigenfunction for it's the eigenvalue is h bar squared l bar l bar times l bar minus one at the at the bottom of our ladder. And so from this, uh, if we uh, since we know that both of those have to put the f uh, bring the function to zero, then we know that uh, we know that um, that our l times l plus one has to be equal to our l bar times l bar minus one, and so if we uh, so that would tell us that the l bar is equal to minus minus l <clears throat> and so from this uh, we can see that uh, that uh, our l is equal to minus l plus n if we add l to both sides we get 2 l equals n uh, and then we have l equals n divided by Two. And this tells us that L is actually in half integers, uh, and that will actually come into play when we get to uh, when we get to spin. So right now we're just talking about the so uh, sort of I guess more classical esque uh, version of angular momentum, which is just like uh, a particle orbiting another particle. Uh, we'll see that we have uh, half integer spins uh, when we get to spin itself. Um, and so from this uh, what we find is that uh, uh, so if we go back here those eigenvalues of L Z as I said are the um, are the M's. Uh, where did I have that here? So right here so we can put the different values of M in for that L and we actually get our uh, our eigenvalues uh, for the LZ operator, and so this is kind of where uh, where the take-home message is. Uh, what we found is that when we uh, act with our L squared, which is the total angular momentum squared on our function, and uh, Griffiths actually puts the M. In L here which is suggestive of the fact as I said that this is going to be the spherical harmonic functions here is equal to h bar squared L times L plus
plus 1 times uh, our spherical harmonic function there, where L can be 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and so on. And our LZ uh, acting on our our spherical harmonic function here is equal to h bar m uh, and then that is multiplied by our spherical harmonic function here where m is equal to minus l uh, going all the way up to plus l and so like I said this is sort of the take-home message here is that these quantum numbers, the L and the M, uh, like I said, they they fell out of the the uh, the associated Legendre functions that we found in the analytic method, looking at the spherical harmonics, and they also happen to be found in the eigenvalues for these functions, looking at it using this algebraic method, and so the last thing I wanted to show which is also sort of a take-home message and uh, I'll actually look at this figure right out of the Griffiths textbook uh, and so I'm actually just going to read right out of the Griffiths textbook and uh, sort of add my own commentary here so Griffiths says some people like to illustrate this with the diagram seen here uh, drawn for the case of L equals 2. The arrows are supposed to represent possible angular momenta in units of h bar. They all have the same length. Uh, in this case it is uh, it is the square root of L times L plus 1 which would uh, end up being the square root of 6 which is 2.45. And their z components are the allowed values of m. So minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, or 2. So you can see here that the z components, uh, so this is a z component here, this is a z component. So it's the z component of these, uh, these big L's here. So the big L's, as I said, are the, uh, are the magnitude of the angular momentum, of the sort of total angular momentum here. Uh, and these, uh, these right here on the sphere are the different m values. And so Griffith says, notice that the magnitude of the vectors, the radius of the sphere, uh, so we can see that this big L here is the radius of the sphere, is greater than the maximum z component. Uh, in general, the square root of L times L plus 1 is going to be greater than L except for the trivial case of L equals zero. Uh, evidently, you can't get the angular momentum to point perfectly along the z direction. At first, this sounds absurd. Why can't I just pick my axes so that z points along the direction of the angular momentum vector? Well, to do that, you would have to know all three components simultaneously, and the uncertainty principle says that this is impossible. Well, all right, but surely once in a while, by good fortune, I will just happen to aim my z axis along the direction of of L, so of this big L right here. Uh, no, no, you have missed the point. It's not merely that you don't, that you don't know all three components of the uh, of the L. There just aren't three components. A particle simply cannot have a determinate angular momentum vector any more than it can simultaneously have a determinate position and momentum. If LZ has a well-defined value, then LX and well LY do not. It is misleading even to draw the vectors in, in this figure. At best, they should be smeared out around the latitude lines to indicate that LX and ly are indeterminate and so essentially what's that is saying is that we shouldn't even have this l right here because that l is existing simultaneously with uh, another l that it maybe even start from right here it's not drawn very straight but right there also an l going right there also 
an L going right there. So, you know, all L's pointing at that circle are all existing simultaneously, telling us that the this L X here and this L Y cannot be known if we know the Z component, which is this two. This two right here is the Z component. That is our M. Uh, and so if we look over here, uh, we, we know the LZ because we know this M here. Uh, in this case, it is uh, up here it is 2. But because we know the LZ, we don't know the LY or the LX. We only know that the LZ component is 2. Uh, but it could be anywhere on this circle here. And same for if we have m equals 1, which is this one down here, uh, then the l would be pointing at any point on this circle. Uh, same for m equals 0 down here, m equals minus 1, and m equals minus 2. Uh, and so, like I said, those are kind of the take-home messages from this video. The first one being that uh, these quantum numbers, the l and the m, uh, can be found using this uh, algebraic or operator uh, formalism here. The same that they, and they're the same L and the same M that we found when we use the analytic method, which is what the previous uh, few videos were about. And the other take home message is this that if we have this. Z component of L, uh, then we can't know the LX and the LY at the same time because this uh, this um, the the size or the magnitude of L. So the the big L here is equal to our the square root of L times L plus one, uh, and so that this square root of L times L plus 1 is greater than our our L. And so this tells us that, uh, that it's uh, essentially larger than what our LZ component is. Uh, because remember, our LZ component is that, is that L, which, uh, which is this M. So the M ranging between minus this and plus this. Uh, but anyway, I feel like I'm starting to ramble a bit here. Um, I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, like I said, in this video, we were essentially looking at these eigenvalues here. So this eigenvalue and this eigenvalue. In the next video, uh, I will look at the eigenfunctions. And as I said, these eigenfunctions will end up being the spherical harmonics. And so uh, that is kind of the take home message here. I hope you found this video useful and I will see you in the next video.